Okay. So today we are looking at section B of the exam, My Brilliant Career and Photograph 51, where you are going to be required to compare and contrast the two texts. Today is going to be a recap. We're going to be looking at setting, context, basic synopsis of the plot, and what are probably the key events that we read through your SACs that are worthy of looking at again. And if you've missed any of these key events um, that your peers have been using, this is your chance to do a little bit of catch up. You should be taking notes, preferably handwritten, but definitely not on your phones. Photograph 51, setting and context. This is something we could have improved on in the SAC. Explaining how the setting and the context really established the views and values of the different characters and the different events in the text, as well as Ziegler's differing interpretation from Miles Franklin. Keep coming back to why people are doing things. And this is because of the time and place in which they lived. It is different to the time and place in which we are reading it and interpreting the text. Thus, we've seen a lot of different values that we probably don't endorse. For example, sexism. Looking at photograph 51, it is set in Britain in the 1950s post-World War II. That has a big impact on the way Rosalind is treated. Think if Rosalind was alive today, how she'd be treated. But you need to be able to explain why. The why is because there are historically entrenched gender biases, particularly towards women in the workplace. Prior to World War II, women weren't particularly working. There were certain fields in which they were proficient, such as maybe nursing, teaching. But then particularly for married women, it was simply not the case. They were homemakers, had domestic roles. Question. Yeah, that, that it was a lasting effect of World War II. So anti-Semitism, um, World War II, particularly involving Hitler and the Jewish race, it did transcend into culture a little bit post-World War II. So that is a good comment to make about uh, Rosalind's Jewishness also being mentioned in the text. So as we said, those uh, values towards women in the workplace were entrenched. Women had limited career opportunities. And if we're talking about work versus career, they're two very different things. You could work as a cleaner or a seamstress, but in terms of an active career, which involves something potentially like long term or advancing in study, um, it really wasn't seen that women had careers because of their place being defined as in the home. This is despite them joining the workforce during the war effort. And that has really been a catalyst for change that you need to acknowledge. Rosalind, like many women, were given opportunities. She had no opportunities in Britain during the wartime, but overseas she enjoyed much success. And many women were out in the workforce filling the roles that men had vacated because they were off fighting on the fronts of the war. Imagine this. What happens when the men come home at the end of World War II? Well, they want their jobs back, don't they? We obviously had mass job shortages because of the number of men killed in action and the number of men injured. But the idea was that the women would go back to the kitchen. Now, this across the 50s when this is being explored is where the women were saying, no, we simply won't do that. We want careers. We have ambition. We have desire. We want to be educated. Um, and this text really encapsulates a lot of that. What we also need to acknowledge is that this was written in 2000. 
This is a creative retelling of the appropriation of Rosalind Franklin's work. We know that she wasn't acknowledged for her work. And what was said behind closed doors in terms of this play, we'll never really know. But this is Ziegler's interpretation and trying to bring forth the views and values that she wants discussed along with Rosalind's narrative. So you want to try and bring this element into your writing. This is Ziegler's opinion. This is Ziegler's thoughts and themes on this topic. You should by now have a good idea of the general synopsis of photograph 51. I was really pleased in the sack with the level of content knowledge. There were a couple of mistakes, but not too many, which was really positive to see. So just in quick recap, this text occurs between 1951 and 1953. As protagonist Rosalind Franklin works to discover the secret to DNA at King's College in London. Upon arrival, Rosalind is informed she will be the assistant of Dr. Maurice Wilkins, which she finds insulting due to the, her international reputation and the pretenses under which she accepted the role. So we immediately have that complication at the beginning of the play. It's important to note that basically from the very start, Ziegler sets up conflict around gender, and that continues throughout the duration of the text. Agreeing to a partnership due to her lack of options, Rosalind is continually patronised by Dr Wilkins, who calls her Rosie or Rosalind and not Dr Franklin. He believes she is difficult and she in turn refuses to collaborate with him due to his disrespect. This leads to a dysfunctional working relationship riddled with suspicion. It would help if you kind of drew a map of Rosalind and Wilkins interactions. Sometimes students just generally talk about their relationships and not the specific comments or the specific interactions that they had. For instance, you could talk about him taking her work and presenting it at a conference as though it was team's work or his own work. Or you could talk about the fact that he brings her back a box of chocolates and feels like that's an appropriate way to engage with a colleague. Make sure that you have specific instances of their relationship if you want to talk about the gender dynamic in that relationship. In an act of betrayal, we get our complication furthered. Wilkins shows Rosalind's photograph 51 to their competitors, James Watson and Francis Crick from the University of Cambridge. It's important to think about why Wilkins does that. Is he wholly just a terrible person? If we look at his backstory about how his wife left, how he's lived quite a lonely life, how he hasn't really had much success in his career, in contrast to Rosalind, we perhaps don't demonise him completely. Rosalind, in turn, has treated him in an icy manner. But again, do we blame Rosalind because of the way he has disrespected her? Or do we blame anyone because these are the entrenched values in which these people have been raised? So it's important to consider why Wilkins does this. In turn, Rosalind continues to work on perfecting her hypothesis due to her adopted notion that she must always be correct as she risks losing her reputation as a woman in science if she makes a singular mistake. So these pressures are both extrinsic on Rosalind, if you look at the comments made by her father, but she adopts them intrinsically 
so within herself in that she must be perfect in order to keep up her reputation. She doesn't have that same freedom that the men have to make mistakes. In the meantime, Rosalind uh, succumbs to ovarian cancer due to exposure to the x-rays. Very ironic ending. One thing that we didn't see much of on your SAC, which could be really helpful in improving for the exam, keeping in mind your exam is worth 50% of your overall mark for English, you want to make improvements on what you've done on the SACs. Think of your SACs as your first go. To make your writing more complex, you can talk about the different symbols within the text. You could look at photograph 51 itself, a symbol of life, a symbol of questionable ethics. The Nobel Prize as a symbol of being competitive or having a race, a symbol of status that each of the um, each of the different characters want the Nobel Prize, I suppose, but for different reasons. And then you see Rosalind, who in contrast is very determined to just get the science behind it right. Um, the accolade meaning much more to Watson and Crick. You could look at the different objects and what they represent. We've got scientific equipment such as the cameras, the microscope, which provide access to power typically used by men and the way that Rosalind actually does have access to these. In fact, some of the best scientific resources in contrast to her competitors. The devastating effect of the x-rays. This is both the way that Rosalind achieves success, but is her ultimate downfall as well, so quite tragic. We see lots of pairs and replications in this text as well. The DNA helix actually having two interwoven parts. The twin tumours that Rosalind jokes she could name Watson and Crick because they're a bit of a pain, aren't they? And then just the pairs of characters themselves, Watson and Crick as a duo, Rosalind and Wilkins as a bit of a duo. Yep. Does that actually say I think you could talk mostly about the idea of relationships being embedded throughout the text. So the relationship between her tumours and her actions um, is definitely important. The idea of not working in isolation as well um, being key to success. There is a mention early and then late again in the text about Shakespeare's play, The Midwinter's Tale. I was really impressed that a couple of students throughout the cohort managed to bring this into their writing. It was clear that they'd done a little bit of extra research. So a symbolic reference which serves as a metaphor for Rosalind. It's used at the beginning at the end of the play as a circular narrative, starts with something and comes back to it. Essentially, if you read into it, it is about a story of regret and the inability to redress the past. And we can see that idea from the Midwinter's Tale being replicated perhaps in Rosalind and Wilkins' relationship as well. You know, what if? And certainly what if they had have seen Midwinter's Tale together? What if they'd had a better relationship? How could this have all worked out? Not just in terms of who wins the Nobel Prize, but what about Rosalind's fate as well? So I suggest doing your own research into the background of Shakespeare's play. Yep. Yeah, I think so. Not remembering who Hermione is is certainly significant as well, especially as almost like complementary material if you want to talk about sexism in the text. So that's good, good um, thinking. Now, I'm not going to go deeply into the passage analysis because we have already done this in class, but you want to start grouping ideas together 
looking at specific events that you know you're probably going to use on the exam. You can't prepare for every single event, but what you can do is prepare a series of classic events that you know you can mould and shape into further discussion. For instance, we have this extract on page 80 where the characters discuss the different what ifs about Rosalind's situation. And it really brings together all of the different issues that she'd faced. The beam, the collaboration, being self-protective, and the different relationships with each character. But we can also think of this as about ambition and power. The idea that ambition and power were predominantly seen to be features of men at this time. That quote there just at the bottom, born another time or born a man, could be deeply analysed to look at Rosalind being a little bit of an outcast, an outlier, an agitator. But you need to have more examples. I felt that students were using a lot of the same content and running out of things to say. In terms of ambition and power, you could also talk about Rosalind's innate desire to always be right, the impact that her father had on her ambition. So in that way, you're not just talking about Rosalind. You're also talking about her father. The power he's had to shape her career um, is very, very important. You could look at Wilkins and Rosalind's dynamic, the fact that this has a complete power imbalance at the start and it continues to develop into suspicion because one or another are in competition. There is a complete lack of trust. Also showing the photo to Watson and Crick, is that about ambition? Not necessarily. But is, is it about power? Is it about Wilkins feeling emasculated? Is it about him feeling disrespected? Is it about him doing what he knows will, you know, frustrate Rosalind? Um, you need to look at those different types of relationships. But also the manipulative power of Watson and Crick to get him to hand over the information. Why not use it for himself? So you need to start thinking about all of those bigger questions. Sexism and the female identity. Um, a lot of students have been pretty comfortable with the, con the concept of gender throughout the text. Again, we have the extract there on page 13 about that first interaction between Rosalind, in which the stage directions describe her tone as icy, um, talking to Dr. Wilkins in quite an abrupt tone about what he calls a misunderstanding, that she would not be his assistant simply because she's a woman. Um, but it's important to note that she begrudgingly agrees to a partnership because she has very little options. But what else could you talk about in terms of sexism or gender or female identity? You could talk about the way Wilkins treats Rosalind. You could look at the box of chocolates that he offers. You should look at other characters. Rosalind isn't the only female character in this text. Looking at the way that Odile Crick slowly leaves her marriage. Looking at the way Margaret Ramsey rejects male suitors in pursuit of her own career. These are other minor examples you can use to complement anything that you're saying about Rosalind. So you don't end up with an essay that is just completely about the protagonist. You could also flip it on its head and instead of talking about Rosalind, talk about the way the male characters treat Rosalind or the way society treats Rosalind. The fact that no one stands up for her, the fact that she's not able to use the male-only common room shows an endorsement of these values, or at least ignoring of the situation by her male, her male counterparts like Gosling, like Wilkins. Marriage and relationships. 
Marriage is huge in my brilliant career, and a lot of people were comfortable talking about that, but probably less so in this text. You should, as part of your revision, develop a table looking at the relationships of the different characters. You have some really successful marriages in the other text, somewhat, um, in terms of longevity, but in terms of whether people are actually happy in these marriages, that is disputed across all of the texts. Is there anyone who's happily married? No, it doesn't really say much for marriage, does it? So when we look at marriage and relationships, we have this relationship here where they talk about Margaret Ramsey and her rejection of the love of her male suitor. But there are plenty of other characters who toy with the idea of a relationship. Don Casper's respect for Rosalind, Wilkin, Wilkins and Rosalind's reflective ending, that perhaps their relationship could have been different. But also Watson and Crick's manipulation of Wilkins. I want you to keep in mind that the word relationships isn't just about romantic relationships or marriages. Think about parent to child relationships, colleague to colleague relationships. There are so many other things that you can talk about because there are lots of really depressing, sad love stories. The Cricks, for example, or even Wilkins' first marriage, really unsuccessful. So make sure you have other things to talk about. Lastly, injustice, isolation and loneliness. We have the extract from page 16 to 17 uh, where we look at the scene in the common room or about the common room showing that Rosalind is not only just excluded based off her gender in terms of career opportunities, she's actually physically excluded. So being able to break down the idea of when she is and isn't included into different scenarios is helpful for you to make other paragraphs. What else could I talk about? You could look at Gosling. Gosling is also quite isolated in his role. There's no one else kind of like him. He's insubordinate to Rosalind and to Wilkins as he is an assistant, so he's also not allowed in the common room. But also he has his own mindset here. It's him who shows the Wilkins the photo in the first place. Rosalind wasn't going to show it to him. And that he believed that that was a type of injustice that Wilkins was being excluded from the find. Obviously, Wilkins' portrayal of Rosalind, but then even Rosalind herself is exclusive in the way she splits the sample into A and B and refuses to collaborate with Wilkins, instead enforcing they have separate work, which all leads to these feelings of loneliness and this suspicion that grows and grows throughout the text. Then we need to start transitioning. We can think about one text in isolation, but you must start thinking about how they do and don't overlap. If you are finding it really difficult to come up with the differences, you need to work harder. If something simply doesn't fit, you should also keep in mind that these texts were never meant to be studied like this. When they were written, these writers wrote their own book with their own views, values and ideas. So sometimes there just simply isn't a connection and that's okay. Throw that idea out and just start again with something else. On this page is a list of comparative statements. One revision activity that you might like to do is to use these as topic sentences for practice paragraphs. For instance, self-belief can either be intrinsic or extrinsic in the characters of my brilliant career and photograph 51. You could write how in one text the characters certainly seem empowered from within, yet the other text that self-belief develops over time, looking perhaps at Sibylla and the way her identity develops over the course of the text. 
Or you could write on something like, Photograph 51 and my brilliant career both explore the notion of patriarchal control, but diverge in their forms, which can be financial, political or relationship based. In my brilliant career, there's a lot of link between finances and between men and women within their families. That whole idea that you are controlled because of your family and that's your only way to be financially successful is to marry. Whereas perhaps we can look at photograph 51 and say this control in this scenario is more relationship based, is that Rosalind um, needs to get along with her male co-workers. So there's a whole lot of different things that we can look at there and there are lots of practice paragraphs for you. <laughs> You might want to start a new subheading because we are going to look at my brilliant career. Again, setting and context is very important. One thing that I do want to bring up about the introductions in the SAC, and none of us did it, but I did see it replicated in a few that I moderated. There was this really generic sentence that said something like, my brilliant career and photograph 51 diverge in time, place and setting, full stop. Please don't write that. It tells me nothing. And of course they do, because they, again, are written at different times by different authors, not for the intended purpose of being studied in this manner. So, my brilliant career setting in context, set against the backdrop of Australian Federation around 1901 really different to again when we're studying and uh, Rosalind in photograph 51, a good 50 years earlier and a completely different place. Australia, who was just on a cusp of establishing national identity. It was a really exciting time for many Australians, breaking away from their Britishness and really defining their own identity. So you can probably see that as a little bit of Sibylla's inspiration for defining her own path, just as Australia did. It was, however, a time of drought and hardship for many rural families, leading to changing roles of women and children. Well, that kind of sounds familiar to what I said about the previous context. Both of them are changing times for women. The women were being more and more taken out of domestic duties in Australia and forced to work on the land or forced to leave their families to go and work as a governess like Sibylla did because they were in such financial hardship. They had to redefine what families looked like and they had to redefine what the roles of women in those families were going to look like. To an extent, it is believed this is an autobiographical rendition of Miles Franklin's own experience, trying to get this book published as a female writer. It can also be considered a coming of age story, so Bill Dung's Roman, or a postmodern text. So looking at quite modern views and values here. Where we did start, start to see plot errors on the SAC was in relation to this text. Students at times um, did come up with incorrect events or incorrect descriptions of characters and what their roles were. So it is worth listening carefully to the synopsis and our next slide, which is notable characters and significance. In my brilliant career, the protagonist, Sibylla Melvin, is introduced as a headstrong, creative girl living with her rural family at Bragabrong in New South Wales. She has a desire to pursue writing, which I think everybody mentioned in the sack. But there is more to the text than this first chapter. So if you didn't read it all, choose something else to talk about. You could talk about the fact her father moves the family on a whim to Possum Gully, 
and he loses the family assets due to poor business decisions. He descends into alcoholism and as such, the responsibilities of the farm and finances fall upon his wife, Lucy, and his daughter, Sibylla. The defiant and wild-spirited Sibylla is sent to live with her grandmother, firstly due to the re difficult relationship with her mother, but also if you consider due to finances, it's one less mouth to feed. Granny Bossia, who lives in Kattegat, takes Sibylla on. Sibylla enjoys her time here reading, playing piano, and essentially learning from her Aunt Helen what it means to be a young woman. So this is quite ideal for Sibylla in terms of her pursuits of what she wants, reading, literature, the arts, but there is a trade-off. There is quite an emphasis on her looks and quite an emphasis from Aunt Helen about trying to spruce up to find a man, which is Granny and Aunt Helen's ultimate goal for Sibylla. While at Kattegat, Sibylla meets Harold Beecham, a wealthy property owner, and Harold falls in love with Sibylla and proposes to her. Despite her rejections and her multiple attempts to engage with other men to make him jealous, he continues to pursue Sibylla. After agreeing to a secret relationship, well, engagement, Sibylla is sent by her mother to Barney's Gap to work as a governess for the M Swats. This is to pay off her family's debts. The family who she goes to work for live in complete squalor and Sibylla struggles to live this lifestyle. Obviously, she's been exposed to the potential freedoms at Kattegat and really, really, um, finds this a very confronting way to live. It kind of foreshadows to her what life of marriage in Australia would be like. Lots of babies, um, running of a household, etc. Very little time for all of the things she enjoys. After breaking down, Sibylla is returned to Possum Gully where she must work on the family farm. Harold, who had lost and then miraculously regained his fortune, returns to claim Sibylla. And I've used that word deliberately, claim. He believes he's coming to collect an asset. And if we look at his letters that he sends to her, the language used is definitely like coming to pick up a goat or something. Now, Sibylla finally and ultimately rejects his advances, saying that she intends to never marry. So she has kind of strung him along for a fair bit. And Harold Beecham, to his credit, is quite gracious um, in his defeat. The way the text ends, and this is where there has been a bit of make-believe by some students when they did their sack, Sibylla is hopeful that she'll be able to pursue a brilliant career. But the story ends with no resolution. We don't know what happens to Sibylla. Um, there is some, there were some people that were talking about her going and living overseas and having a wonderful life, and that certainly didn't happen. She just has this big revelation about Australia, and then that's the end of the text. So what we can do is live in some hope, as Sibylla is, that there may be a brilliant career. We have no idea. Edge. Yes. So, the other issue with the sacks. There are other characters other than Sibylla and other events other than what Sibylla is involved in that you can talk about. The high scoring essays had a wide range of examples that worked together. I strongly encourage you for the exam, if you do not know anything else about my brilliant career other than Sibylla, you do try to branch out. This table will help you with your revision and you can start to look at the different ways different characters represent different ideas. For example, Harold Beecham. He is quite a hero of the text. 
he is that soft, gentle giant that you think that all the women would swoon over. He is representative of traditional marriage values. Yet he's also representative of men, that they simply do not understand women, particularly the way he doesn't understand Sibylla. He offers her a study. He offers her a desk. He offers her everything other than true freedom. But he has some good attributes in that he has a financial and moral responsibility to her. So he is a complex character and you should look at what he represents in the text. You also have Lucy Melvin, Sibylla's mother. She is hardened by a life of poverty. She is a victim of decisions made by men, in particular her husband. Yet she has a strong sense of duty and family obligation. A lot of people have written Lucy off to be this terrible witch of a character, but again has not considered why she behaves the way that she does. She's all about saving her family from financial ruin. Um, as such, we can begin to understand some of the decisions she makes about Sibylla. Richard Melvin, also known as Dick, which again, someone actually wrote in their sack. We don't need you to tell me about their nicknames. Um, he is representative of unfulfilled ambition. And of course, also representative of catastrophic consequences. When people who shouldn't be making decisions do. And in this text, it was Richard. His decisions impact the powerless women in his life and he has little regard for the consequences. The other minor characters I strongly advise you to start using. The idea of Granny Bossia and Aunt Helen also being different types of women. Granny actually has some power, not ultimate power, but she is strong minded, financially independent. She's the matriarch of her family. Yet she also has strong links to social expectations. She has a strong value placed on parental authority and an appropriate place for women in society. So she's a little bit of a walking contradiction, Granny. You then have Aunt Helen that represents that beauty is no guarantee of love and success. She ticked all the boxes, yet she has been returned back to her mother as a now untouchable divorcee. So we can look at her as well. Everard Gray, who was the gentleman who wanted to take Sibylla onto the stage. Again, an example of limited opportunity for women in the fact that Sibylla could only go with him if she agreed to marry him. Boring. And lastly, but I think overlooked the most, uh, Mr. and Mrs. M. Swat. Almost like a little microcosm of what a typical family would look like in rural Australia. Despite their wealth, these characters live in squalor. They highlight the poverty and the negatives of rigid gender roles. We have this Mr. M. Swat with his savvy business style contrasted against his wife, who is essentially this disheveled woman left exhausted after multiple consecutive pregnancies. So if we look at those two characters side by side, we start to see um, the impact of those rigid gender roles. <clears throat> Very quickly looking through the last couple of slides. When you look at ambition and power in the text, yes, you can talk about Sibylla as a writer, but you should start looking for these other examples and annotating them in your text. Harold Beecham working to regain his fortune. Sibylla, not just in her power in pursuit of being a writer, but in her power to reject marriage proposals. Her rejection of Frank Howden, her rejection of Harry Beecham. That is something she has control over. And of course, Granny, who in some ways does have power, but was powerless to prevent uh, Sibylla's sentence to go to Barney's Gap. Those aren't all Sibylla examples. Sexism and the female identity. A lot of people, again, use Sibylla as a writer as an example. 
But instead, you could talk about the way she couldn't join the stage because she had to marry Everard Grey. Also, her granny felt that it was inappropriate. Instead of talking about that, you could talk about her brother Horace being able to leave Possum Gully when Sibylla had to stay. You could look at Blanche, who was the beautiful woman who was following around Harry Beecham at the races, as a representation of what a typical uh, young Australian woman would be looking like and doing. But also you could look at the treatment of Helen. Everyone thinks, oh, this is lovely. Helen gets to go back and live with her mum. But it's a form of social humiliation. She is deemed unworthy of an additional marriage. She's been used and shamed. So we need to look at Helen as another example of the way women are poorly treated in the text. Marriages and relationships. Most students spoke about Sibylla's relationship with Harold. Again, it is the main relationship in the text, the will they or won't they. But other relationships you could talk about. You could talk about Dick's decision um, to risk their livelihood at Possum Gully and the way that impacts Lucy, but also the rest of his family. So again, thinking of marriage as not just the only type of relationship in the text. His relationship with his children changes as well. Sibylla thinks of him as a bit of a dick. Ha <laughs> ha. Sibylla's jealousy of Gertie. So the sibling relationship there, jealousies. I know that Wilkins and Rosalind aren't brother and sister, but there's jealousy that exists in that relationship. The same way that Sibylla is a little bit jealous of Gertie once she hears that perhaps Harry Beecham is interested in her. You could look at Lucy's relationship with Sibylla, the way that it is perceived certainly by Sibylla that this is unjust treatment. You could then contrast that against Rosalind's relationship with her own father. And then you could look at the other maternal relationship that Sibylla has with Aunt Helen, who does try to nurture and teach Sibylla the only thing that she kind of knows about beauty and relationships. Lastly, injustice, isolation and loneliness. Again, the common example for this was Sibylla being forced to leave Kattegat because her mother basically forces her to. Great example to use, but what else could you use? This is where you can start bringing in the more symbolic elements of this text. The symbolic suffering of the cattle. Early in the text, we see Sibylla and her family struggling to keep the cattle alive, doing everything they can to raise them onto their feet. And this could obviously be seen as a contrast against what the Australian people were struggling through with the drought. You could look at Sibylla's letters to both her mother Lucy and to Granny Bossia, pleading against injustice. And that also links to isolation and loneliness because at times the letters are her only way of communicating. And lastly, her inability to pursue stage work without marriage is very indicative of injustice faced by women. With those examples in mind, it's up to you to research them further. Get the quotes so you can actually write on them. Next lesson, we're going to be comparing and contrasting. So it's important that, again, you have quotes, you have other bits of evidence to talk about, because this is not enough to get you through the exam. You have to do the hard work and get the quotes and start the practice writing.